receive your salvation just to possess it. You and I are to become the Christians God saved us to become. I would like you to take the Word of God, please, and turn with me to the book of Exodus. And we'll begin in Exodus chapter 14 with verse 13. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13. This amazing story is familiar to almost every Christian. It's the story of God's deliverance of His people through the Red Sea. He had delivered them from the yoke of Egyptian bondage after 430 years of bondage. He broke that yoke by His mighty power, proving His greatness. And as He says in His Word, getting honor for Himself. And as we get in the midst of this story in the 14th chapter of Exodus, beginning with verse 13, the Bible says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. If you're in the habit of marking things, I want you to connect these thoughts, if you would, please. They're found in verse 13 and verse 15. First, the two words in verse 13, stand still. Stand still. And in verse 15, go forward. These seem to be expressions that do not belong together but they do belong together. There's so much going forward without ever having stood still. There's so much attempt at doing things without ever spending any time with God to get His direction. And so the Lord said here, stand still and go forward. I want you to hold your place here just a moment and turn with me to the Psalms, would you? Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Be still, he says. And know that I am God. And God instructed Moses to say to these frightened people, Be still. And then he instructed Moses to say to these people, Go forward. I don't think we shall ever launch out into the deep and go forward to the degree God desires for us to go until we've learned to be still and know that He is God. We're praying for world evangelism. We're asking God to help us be obedient to Him in the matter of going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. 
But the extent of our evangelism has everything to do with our willingness to be still and know that God is God. There has to be revival. And the energy of that revival, the thrust of God's Holy Spirit in that revival, as we recognize God again and made, made aware of the Lord and His mighty power, will be the thing that thrusts us forward in the work of world evangelism. We must be still in order to go forward. No doubt about it. You remember in this story that God used these plagues upon Egypt to break their power and to judge their gods and to prove that He is greater than all the gods of Egypt and greater than this powerful nation of Egypt. If you look back with me just a bit as we dig a little deeper in the preparation for this 14th chapter, if you'll turn back to chapter 12, and the Bible says, begin with verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. I want you to mark that against all the gods of Egypt. If you want a greater understanding of these plagues that God brought to Egypt, these plagues were not just to destroy Egypt. They were to honor God and bring glory to God and prove the greatness of God, that He is greater than all the gods of Egypt with the death of the firstborn. Now this was not meaning that just a death in a house of the firstborn child. Every firstborn, every firstborn. If I happen to be an Egyptian, when that death angel passed through and passed over where the blood had been sprinkled there in the homes of those Hebrews, in my home, if I were an Egyptian, I was the firstborn of four children, I would have died. In my home, my son, oldest son, who was in this meeting, would have died. The firstborn of beast would have died. Notice what the Bible says. He instructs the people to remember this day as the Passover. In verse 26, it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed the head and worshipped. Verse 29, it came to pass that at the midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Imagine that. Imagine the screams and cries of this great Egyptian empire where there was not a house where there's not one dead. As a matter of fact, when they witnessed the judgment of God, in verse 33 the Bible says, And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, that's the Egyptians, we be all dead men. God is at work. Often we think, what is the Lord doing? He's working to bring glory to Himself. And we need to be aware of this. Now, after 430 years, they're free to go. And in this flight from Egypt and in this deliverance from Egypt and through the Red Sea, God teaches us so many lessons for the Christian life. And I want you to write some of them down, would you please? He brings us to the place of freedom. Would you make note of that? He brings us to the place of freedom. The only real freedom we shall ever find is in the Lord who makes us free from the law of sin and death. He sets us free. We're in bondage. We're in bondage to the devil. We're in bondage to the self-life and the rule of the self-life. But God sets us free. Let's look at chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp 
before Pi Ha Hiroth. A little difficult to pronounce. Between Migdal and the sea over against Belzephon. Before it shall ye camp and camp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so, and it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth and before Beth Belzephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Isn't it strange that there's so much fear where there's supposed to be so much faith? I said I was going to deal with you and pray that God will deal with my own heart and God will deal with you as I speak on the matter of faith in God, trusting God, remembering that faith is described for us in Hebrews chapter 11 as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But it's defined for us in Hebrews chapter 12 as looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And often we get the idea that God has forsaken us when God has not forsaken us at all. God knows exactly what's going on. He's surrounding us. He's nearer than our hands and feet and closer to us than our very breathing. But He's giving us an opportunity to look to Him in our deepest fears and frettings and find that He's able, He's always able, always able. And the Lord drops a clue for us here. I want you to look at that difficult word to pronounce, would you? And mark it. The Lord said, I want you to turn. I'm going to trap you. I'm going to put you in a place where the Red Sea is in front of you and walls like the walls of a canyon are beside you to your left and right. And then I'm going to shut the door. And when I close the door, I'm going to shut the door with the Egyptian army behind you. And when you look in front of you, you're going to see the Red Sea, which you cannot pass through with your own effort. You're going to look to your left and right and see walls of stone that you cannot climb or maneuver over. And you're going to look behind you and you're going to see the Egyptian army. I'm going to put you where there is no way out but God. Now, this word, Pi hath Hiroth, would you write this down? Means the place of freedom. That's what the word means, the place of freedom. It's a place where God is going to make you free. Now the Lord sees everything. 
we talk about past, present, and future. Remember, God is eternally present. And He sees everything. There's no past or future with the Lord. Even when we speak of our redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. And before any man ever walked on the earth, it was already determined in the counsel of the Godhead that Jesus Christ would bleed and die, God the Son would bleed and die for our sin. He became sin for us. He who knew no sin that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. The Lord knows the outcome. Now here's the difficult thing. We don't have to know the outcome. We just have to know the Lord. And He'll see us through. How many of you have ever felt trapped and you weren't going to make it, but you're here? You made it. Some of you felt like you weren't going to live through something, but you did because you're here. When God wants to build a strong faith, He places us in places, even in circumstances, where the only way deliverance can come is by His mighty hand. And He uses things. I was just reading again Richard Sibbs. A bruised reed. I recommend it to everybody. And I, I was reminded again by that Puritan writer that we are bruised reeds. We're not mighty oak trees. We're not even reeds. We're bruised reeds. Bruised reeds. And we're bruised and helpless, strengthless. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. And God works to make us as weak as we need to be to trust His strength. And may God help us here. He brought him to this place. Now, He also had the Pharaoh, the leader of the army of Egypt, to say, Aha! These foolish, thoughtless, ignorant Israelites... That's what the world thinks of God's people. And they think so less of God than we ever imagined. They've entrapped themselves. They've gotten themselves in a place that they cannot get out. The sea's in front of them. The walls of rock on either side of them. And we're behind them. They're as good as dead. And let's remember that in the place of death for some is the place of life for others. And God has brought them to the place, of, the place of freedom. Now, the plan's made. The Egyptians plan to overtake them. Of course, God has other plans. And let's read on. And we're going to find out that this standing still and going forward not only brings us to the place of freedom, but it brings us to the place of forward movement. Now the last thing you would ever imagine these people could do now is move forward. The last thing you'd ever think they would talk about is moving forward. What's the key to moving forward? Standing still. We're never going to move forward unless we stand still. You see, because the temptation we have, all of us, all of us, especially those of us who consider ourselves to be strong without being strong in the Lord, we're strong people, we, we can persuade people, we can speak to people, we can out-argue people, we can maneuver our way through this. And we either learn to live by force or by faith. Are you tired of trying to live by force and just using your own ingenuity, your own ability, your own maneuvering? your own planning, your own scheming, your own argument, your own debating? Are you frustrated about the fact that you can't get inside someone's heart and really change them, but you're still trying to do it? You see, God brings us to the place of deciding again and again, am I going to live by force or am I going to live by faith? Which way? And so He's bringing us to the place where there's going to be Forward movement, not just freedom, but forward movement. And before I begin to read, I want you to hold your place here and turn with me to the book of James. Just one little expression in the book of James, in chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 25 of 
the book of James, this book of practical Christianity and believing and behaving. In James chapter 1, verse 25, the Bible says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And the expression I want you to note is law of liberty. You wouldn't put those two words together either. Just like stand still and go forward, you wouldn't put law and liberty together. But God says that he is referring here to the law of liberty. Look at it again. Whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty. This law of liberty. And that expression is used because exactly opposite of what the world would imagine, the believer must come to understand by faith that obeying God and doing what God's Word says, being obedient, allowing the rule of God's Word in your life, is not an imprisonment. It's not a restriction. I hope you get beyond that. Looking into God's Word and being obedient to God's Word and making yourself a servant of the Word of God and surrendering to God is not an imprisonment. It closes us up with Christ. It brings us to the place where we are alone, we are alone with God. It gives us a renewed vision of the Lord. And by the way, we cannot worship God any more truly and fully than our vision of God. That's why the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that we should consider the sum. The sum, when we consider Christ, we consider the sum. We don't look at part of the Lord's life and His earthly journey and worship Him as a baby in a manger or worship Him just as a teacher or worship Him as a, as a one hanging on the cross. But we have to see Him in the sum of this that he bled and died for our sins, he was buried and he rose from the dead, he's alive forevermore and he's seated in heaven where he ever lived to make intercession for us. When you think of Jesus, how do you think of him? When you and I consider the Lord Jesus Christ, are you stuck on seeing him as a baby in a, in a, in a manger? That's why I believe God warns us about those images. Are you, are you stuck on the fact of seeing him hang on a cross? Is that where you stop with this? Or do you see him high and exalted, given a name which is above every name, and that that name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? You see, we need that high, exalted vision of God if we're going to worship God for who he truly is. Even when the Lord taught his disciples to pray, he said, this is where you begin in prayer. Listen carefully. He said, you pray this way, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You recognize that God is high and exalted, higher than all others. There's no one like Him. He is the only true and living God. And you hallow His name. You exalt His name and lift Him up high. You don't get that except standing still and thinking on who He is. This encourages your faith. It strengthens you in the Lord. And to try to run forward without having first done that is to run in your own strength and to continue to labor and fight your way out of something instead of knowing that your strength is in the Lord and His strength is made perfect in your weakness. And if you think you learned that once, believe me, my dear ones, God takes you through it again and again. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say something that I believe is true. And the deeper you go, the higher God wants to use you if you'll let Him. And when the Lord intends to continue to use you, He's going to take you through one trial after the other. One trial after the other. And I don't think you could imagine or I could imagine a man that's been blessed like I blessed or like you're blessed when we say, oh, God has poured out his goodness. He's loaded us daily with his blessed benefits. I don't think we could ever say we're going to be blessed and blessed and blessed unless we have to pause at times and stand still and recognize our weakness, his strength and glory in the Lord instead of our accomplishments before we can move forward. Do you want to move forward? How many of you want to move forward? Well, you're going to have to stand still. And to stand still, you're going to have to feel without strength, without strength. You have to recognize your weakness. Some of you have gone through a real breaking recently. 
disappointed in yourself? Finding out how big a failure you are? I don't like to dwell on that. But when God does allow it, He allows it so we get our eyes on Him. And so let me read now. They're saying it'd been better, been better if we died in Egypt. Or, I mean, you know, it'd been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. You're going to die somewhere where you want to die. Verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Oh, that's, that's the place of victory. I want to fight for myself. It's in my nature and your nature to fight for ourselves. It's in your nature and my nature when someone has hurt someone else that we love, we want to fight also for them. Who's best at fighting? You or God? Who's best at fighting? Me or God? Now, I'm, I'm a fighter and you're a fighter, but we don't fight in God's place. We go into battle with the Lord at His direction. We don't try to take God's place in the matter. Perhaps unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way we look at it, when you get visibility of any kind, you get vulnerability. And you're set out there as a target. Expectations rise. People can become unreasonable. They want you to conform to their image and their idea and their way of thinking. And you suffer from that pressure and you decide if you're going to fight against the critics or you're going to let God take care of you. You're going to fight with your children or you're going to pray and let God take care of you. You're going to fight with your husband or wife or you're going to pray and let God take care of you. Now, there may be some reasoning that has to be done, but nothing needs to be done in place of God. Nothing. So the Lord brings them face to face with impossibility. And he says, you, you realize the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And by the way, if we don't hold our peace, we're not allowing God to fight for us. And God does not fight for us unless we hold our peace. The Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. What? Yes. There's a sea out there in front of us. Go forward. How could they even dare go forward? Because they've been standing still to see the salvation of the Lord. Have you ever gotten in the place where God has become so great to you and so real to you that in that moment you have faith to trust Him for something that you formerly could not trust Him and would not trust Him, but now He's revealed His greatness to you and you understand He is God, you will keep His word, and you fear Him and you're going to move forward. Let's read on. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon the chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Now, that represents the presence of God, and now God has gone behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Notice this. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, that is the Egyptians, but it gave light to by night to these, that is the Israelites. 
so that the one came not near the other all the night. Now here, the Egyptians behind them are in the darkness. God's people in front of them are in the light. All night, they're in the light. All night, the Egyptians are in the darkness. God said, go forward. God has given them light to go forward. We always move forward in the light God gives us. He's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Just like when you get in your automobile at night, you drive, you drive with your lights on in your automobile and you go where the light shines, you drive in that space. You don't drive all the way from where you leave if you left from here to get home. You drive just where the light's shining. And God gives us enough light to move forward. Some of you are like this, and I get this way. We all get this way. We say, well, I want to know what about way out yonder somewhere, what God's going to do in, in the future, what God's going to do. The Lord says, no, no, no. You just follow the light I give you. And when you stop following that light, God stops giving it to you and to me. You see, there's a time to stand still, and that's a part of our lives always, but there's a time to move forward. There's forward movement, and we move forward as God gives direction. We move forward. We don't hurry, and we say sometimes, well, God's awfully late around here. No, we're just early. He's going to show up just when he needs to, and he'll give light. He gives light. And I, I believe the Spirit of God makes application of this in your life and mine. And the application he makes in your life may not be exactly the same way he applies it in my life, but God does give light. As he opens a door, as he brings someone across our path, you say, I'd like to see Jesus. Well, you may have seen him today and somebody came and spoke to you about something or some opportunity that came your way or some call you got or a letter you received. The Lord is orchestrating things on our behalf as we wait on him. No doubt about that. And so here it is in Moses, verse 21, stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Now, there are, there are authors and commentators like uh, Arthur Pink and others who believe that God didn't open up the whole sea. He only opened up the sea as they went into it. In other words, it wasn't open from shore to shore. I can't speak definitively about that, and I don't think anyone else can, but we can have ideas I'm perfectly all right with believing that just parts of the sea opened up as they went into it. God continued to open it up. If I'm interested at all, I don't think it will be when I get to heaven. I'll ask the question, but when I get to heaven, I don't think I'll be concerned about that. But anyway, and the children of Israel, verse 22, the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now remember, they're trying to operate in the dark, and God's people are operating in the light. Do you realize we have something the world doesn't have? Are you living the same way the world lives, at guesswork and your schemes and plans? Are you walking as God opens the path for you? It came to pass, verse 24, that in the morning watch, tells us exactly what had happened, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord. Notice that. All capital letters, the Lord, Jehovah the covenant God of Israel. It's the, same, it's the same thing. Moses stood in the court of Pharaoh. God said, you go tell him. And he stood there and he says, I don't know your God. I don't know him. You talk about this tribal God of these Hebrew people. I don't recognize him. Now, they're all recognizing that the covenant God of Israel is the God who's doing this. The Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. Isn't that exactly what God said he'd do in verse 14? Let me read those verses together. Verse 14, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. The Egyptians said in the closing part of verse 25, the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And by the way, in our lives, did you know we have an opportunity 
to witness to people who have been directly opposed to us when God begins to fight for us and they recognize that our God is doing something that they can't do on their own and we couldn't do on our own. That brings us not only to this place of freedom and this forward movement, but to fearing the Lord. When God concludes his comments about an unbelieving world, he, he says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. We need to fear the Lord. And by the way, if we have the right fear of God, it releases us from all lesser fears. You understand that? That means when, when we are frightened about things, how in the world is this going to turn out, Lord? I'm worried sick about this. But when you believe that God is able to take care of that, you can be relieved from those lesser fears by having the greater fear, the fear of God. If you want to know how to get peace in your heart, it comes from the fear of God. Fearing the greatest releases us from the fears of the least. Do you fear God? You know one of the great indications of whether or not you and I fear God? Can I give it to you? Let me just say for me, one of the great indications of whether I truly fear God is how many things I let become a fret and a fear to me. When I can release those things because I know God is able to care for it, that's evidence that I truly am fearing God. But when I can't release those things and I'm still trying to manipulate, still trying to convince, still trying to overpower things, it's evidence that I'm not really fearing God. Isn't it awfully convicting when we realize we're not really fearing God because of so many things we fret and fear? And it's just that indication that we're not really fearing God like we ought to fear God because if we fear God like we ought to fear God, we know God can take care of those things. Oh, beloved, let's get our eyes on Jesus. Let me read this quickly, verse 26 and following. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, and the waters may come again, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned and his strength to its strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of the Pharaoh and that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Think of it. That was something when the death of the firstborn came and there wasn't a house where there wasn't a death. But now there's death everywhere. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the, that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord at his servant, Moses. We're not going to read the next chapter, but when you read it at your leisure, I want you to know, it's the first time they'd sung like that in 430 years. They sang the song of Moses. They'd never sung like that before. Not like that, never. Not in 430 years had the Israelites sung like they sung after that. Will you listen with your heart just a minute? You and I think we're entrapped, we're up against it, we talk like the rest of the world, we talk like we're hopeless people and don't have a father. We talk like we're people who can't, can't get through, can't live, can't make it. But God has really just brought us to the place of freedom where he's about to deliver his children who will honor and obey him. Have we obeyed him? Have we obeyed him? Did we turn where he said turn? Have we obeyed him? If we've obeyed him, if we've truly obeyed him, you say it's just a guessing game. No, it's not a guessing game. You say nobody can know. Oh, yes, you can know. It's not a guessing game. It doesn't have to be a guessing game. Have we obeyed the Lord? 
The most critical thing in this ministry is standing still to know the mind of God. Is this what God wants? Lord, don't let me be foolish. Lord, deliver me from my self-life. Lord, don't let me do what I'm not supposed to do. But at the same time, am I to trust God for anything? Are we to move forward? Yes, we're to move forward. How can the world be evangelized if we don't move forward? How can we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ if we don't move forward? So how do we move forward? Standing still, getting a renewed vision of our God, high exalted and lifted up, and the clearer our vision of God, the clearer everything in life becomes. So he brings us to this place of freedom. He leads us in standing still, just as the Word of God says here, stand still so we can move forward. And then he increases our fear of God to relieve us from lesser fears. And now we sing because our hearts have been touched by God like they've never been touched and touched by the fear of God. Isn't it strange that people can't sing, really can't sing praises to the Lord unless they fear God? You'd think those two things don't go together, wouldn't you? From, from our human reasoning, you'd think fearing God makes us sing with a greater heart. Oh, yes. Why? Because all the little fears run for their lives because the greater fear of God, and we sing about God, we rejoice in the Lord. We know He's our Father. We shout it out because we're in the victory now. Having stood still, gone forward, seen God work. You know, as I look back across my life and the life and ministry of this church the Lord's allowed us to have, when I look back across it, I think of things that represent victories. We, we have things like that. I remember one time we, we had a great victory here moving forward and building buildings and enlarging things and seeing God provide one day I said, we need to take an offering, people. We need to take an offering because we've run over on this building. We need to take an offering. I said, we need to get serious about this. And I'm not talking about a 5 or $10 offering. And the people gave over $660,000 in one offering. And you know what? That wasn't a great thing. It's just God proving himself. Some people gave $100,000, I was told. Some people gave $50,000, I was told. I don't know to this day who did it. I never looked. Don't want to know. I thought it might take my eyes off the Lord and put my eyes on people and trust people. But God did it. We went out here. We were all enthused. We went out here and built a little park. And we had 12 stones put there. And we said when we had those stones put there, that's going to remind everybody. When the children ask, what mean these stones? We're going to say, this is something the Lord did. Do, do you think that we should say that now? We're just going to sit around and look at that the rest of our lives. We're all finished with doing anything for God. No more victories to be won. No more anything to be done. Or should we say, let's stand still, see the salvation of God, and move forward and sing again the song of victory. I say, let's stand still again and see the greatness of God and move forward and shout to victory. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Well, you pray. Let's pray together, may we? <laughs> Lord, we give you glory for your precious word. Help us. Oh, God, we need you. Help us. Help me. Help me to faith you, to trust you, to believe you. Sometimes we tremble and blow like a leaf in the wind. Oh, Lord, establish our ways. Help us now. In Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. How many of you know this is just for you? Just to encourage you and cheer you on at this juncture in your life. You know it's just for you. You need it. And God has given you something to help you from his word. Would you lift your hand? Hold it high. God bless you. I want you to come in a moment and tell the Lord. I want you to come and tell him. And by the way, how many of you know that he's got to box you in if he's going to deliver you out? And how many of you feel boxed in? Would you raise your hand? Look. Write that word down. That pi hath hireth. Write it down. That strange word. 
That may be where you are. He knows where you are. He knows where you are. May God help us. Trust him. Trust him. I want you to stand quietly with me, would you please? My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Now hear me while I pray. Take all my guilt away. Oh, let me from this day be wholly thine. May thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart. Some of you want to put your life and influence in this church as a member. You come and tell us, this is the kind of church I want to belong to. You come and do that. Leave your place and come now, would you please? All around. May the Lord help you. Come and tell one of our workers. That's what I'm coming for. Please, greet the folks here, would you please? Greet them. They're coming to tell us this is why they're coming. God bless them. Someone says, I've been saved but never obedient to Christ in baptism since I've been saved. You come and tell us. Are you willing to obey the Lord? He said, turn. What? Turn into this box canyon. Turn and go in here with the Red Sea in front of you. Turn and camp there while the Egyptians settle down behind you. Huh. And they did. And God opened up the sea. What a wonderful story. And it's true. It's true. You raise your hand as God speaks to you. As we sing in a moment, you leave your place and come. Tell the Lord. When you come to pray, and come to the Lord here. Don't go back until we finish. Father, may thy will be done in Christ's name. Amen. Hymn 200. Let's sing it. As God has touched your heart, you leave your place and come. Would you please? My.